Greetings, everyone, throughout the globe, Pacific, Hawaii, West Coast, East Coast, also Scandinavia, Germany, Balkans, and anywhere else. Uh, my program today is saluting piano greats, giants, and it's appropriate the timing because one of my heroes and many musicians heroes the great Barry Harris passed away just before his 92nd birthday a few days ago and you can go to barryharris.com and you can see a wonderful video service and a fine pianist from New York who studied with Barry, Michael Weiss, did a great eulogy. Not too long, but he said it so well what Barry was about. And uh, I had close relationship with him. I wish I could have studied, but we had connection all the time, but I studied Barry through recordings. So, to continue, we are also saluting Bud Powell, Hank Jones, Tommy Flanagan, Red Garland, Sonny Clark, and Bill Evans. The first piece is a Teddy Wilson recording that he did with young Lena Horn, who had a, such a beautiful, soft, soulful voice. This is out of nowhere, 1941.
Teddy Wilson in the 30s, influenced of course by pianists before him, Earl Father Hines, Fats Waller, R. Tatum, was perhaps the first to play beautiful melodic lines, lyrical lines with a light touch. He also studied classical music and he had a strong, of course, jazz, bluesish flavor, but it was done so subtly in a stride style. And uh, Lena Horn was 24 years old in 1941. Her early singing had a soft, flowing, soulful voice something totally opposite of later today's jazz singing over the top bashing of course thank god there are a few younger ones today who listen you know but i'm talking in general and uh, lena horn was also dedicated to helping the people and african-americans standing up an example during Second World War, she was already becoming a movie star. They called her to sing for the soldiers. And in the hall, sitting in the front row, were the Nazi captured prisoners. The black soldiers were placed in the back. She simply said, if you don't straighten this out, I'm not singing. We have to have some equality here in who sits where. That's the way she was. And the outstanding Bay Area drummer who spent 20 years in New York, Akira Tana, did five albums with Lena Horn. So now I will mention another jazz hero, alive and well. Her name is Linda McGillray. She's a graphic artist, worked in that business so many years, and all the flyers that you see on the website for me or on the YouTube she created, designing, placing different colors, pictures, great taste, and she, the reason for her big reason for her loving jazz comes from her father. Her father lived in Kansas City in the 30s during all the heyday activities. Count Basie, Lexter Young, all the great tenor players. Coleman Hawkins was there battling too. And her father played on the radio. He played stride piano. And then in 1941, or 1940 or so, they moved to Dallas, Texas, Texas, and he became, he continued playing in a church. He did it earlier, but he specialized in hymns, and he discovered one hymn in particular that nobody else played. So Linda is known as Miss Kitty because she drew, in the old days, she drew jazz cats playing instruments. And thank you, Miss Kitty. Uh, her father also uh, hung out with Count Basie one time, she told me, exchanging ideas. So that's her background. She's active and well. God bless you, Miss Kitty. Keep swinging. Okie doke. The first tune was written out of Nover by MGM composer Johnny Green in 1931. And great composer. He also wrote Body and Soul. Now I'd like to do another Teddy Wilson tune, When Your Lover Is Gone, from the same year.
this selection was writ written by a gentleman whose parents came from Finland. His name was Einar Aaron Swan. He played saxophone, had his own band, and he shows you people from all over the world came and fell in love with jazz and became very close, authentic to the music. And uh, Teddy Wilson, uh, what I'd like to say, all the great bebop pianists and even some later had roots in the swing era, blues gospel. And I would suggest to all the younger pianists who are always interested in something new, that's the thing in America, always be different, something new. Miles Davis, who played authentic, great stuff in the beginning to a part, and then in the 60s and later, oh, I have to be different, but to me, different is not better. This is my opinion. His later stuff he did was always musical, but it became colder for me. Swing era and the bebop era, there was something warm the way they played. That's the way it is in some decades. Now, two guys now that I'm going to pay tribute, Tommy Flanagan and Barry Harris. Actually, it's Tommy Flanagan and Hank Jones first. Hank Jones is older. He was there during the 30s absorbing Fats Waller and then Bud Powell and Tommy came later. They're both from Detroit, but they both are distinguished for having a light touch. It's clear bebop lines, bebop rhythms and melodies, but rooted in swing, influenced by Teddy Wilson. To give credit to Miles, this French tune, Autumn Leaves, written by Joseph Kosma, who was Hungarian origin, Miles recorded it in the mid-50s with Cannibal. So, nice version of Autumn Leaves, and it became a staple. And then Tommy and Hank Jones recorded it on a beautiful CD called Our Delights. You see little chocolates, Our Delights. This is Autumn Leaves.
next uh, we go to a composition by Bud Powell. I mentioned previously Bud had phenomenal technique. He studied classical music. His piano instructor wanted him to be on a concert stage and when Charlie Parker came along many people were bitten positively by that new language. Swinging in first rooted in swing era style, but Bird added fresh syncopation, making it even more, if you want to call it, uh, I forget the word, rubbery or more kind of looser, you know, it had that special elastic phrasing, the, the notes swung, but sometimes there were rests, they fell on odd beats, but it's the rest, the rake, that makes the phrase stronger when you connect the space and you hit the next note. So Charlie Parker did all of that, and uh, Barry Harris, one of the true jazz heroes who spread jazz throughout the world, his rhythm Many people agree his bebop phrasing was unmatched. The notes danced, they were so loose, they were so well connected and spring feeling. That's what I was trying to say, rubbery. They had that spring feeling and just flowed beautifully. When Barry heard in 46 Bud Powell original Web City, he memorized the solo note for note and he got the language. That's what happens when I had my workshops. I would say, if you're going to learn Debussy, Ravel, Chopin, you go to the source. You listen what they did and match that feeling and that atmosphere, the musical message. The source here, Teddy Wilson, Bud Powell, Art Tatum. In the future, when I get even more playing shape, I'll do something by Art Tatum. And uh, so Barry, by learning the solo, Bud Powell figured that where Bud was going musically. And, and this, piece, this piece, 1950, Dance of the Infidels, featured in the front line, Sonny Rollins, one of the, another giant, great tenor player who absorbed that language and trumpet player today you don't know much about compared because he, he passed away young, I think in the 50s. Fats Navarro had a golden tone. I think Clifford Brown loved him. He, I'm sure he was influenced by him. And you had Tommy Potter on the bass and Roy Haynes, Charlie Parker's rhythm section. Dance of the Infidels is a 12-bar blues that uses more substitute bebop harmony.
like to thank the producer from the 90s. We're still in touch. He's in New York now, in the New York area, uh, upstate New York. Very busy young man. Mark Hyatt, he produced this album. My solo album called Deja Vu. And the name, thank you, to his friend who I'm in touch with, Stu Kohler. He came up with the name Deja Vu. So I recorded that, and um, Barry Harris has a number of recordings of this, all first-rate interpretations. And uh, as you know, Barry taught so many people, teaching them how to phrase, how to connect melodies. Great, great person. I was fortunate to keep in touch. And in New York, which can be a cold place, he welcomed me when I came, introduced me to his audience in a club, and then there was a wonderful club just as I was leaving five years later, Upper East Side, called Fortune Garden Pavilion, had great Chinese food. Barry played there, Tommy Flanagan, and Barry introduced me to the owner. I'm standing right there, and he said, hey, you should have this cat play in your club, and the owner hired me. However, I got a call from the Hyatt to play five, six nights a week. It was hard to turn down. After five years in New York, it was great, but ice and snow, driving with cars overturned, I figured I needed to get back to some warm weather. So the owner understood, but that's, that was Barry Harris. Let me mention quick another jazz hero, good friend, He's my age, he still plays, but there are no gigs these days. But he, he was in, the, in his time, 50s and 60s, he knew all the cats. Blue Mitchell, Miles, his name is George Martin. He, speak, he, speak, he, he learned to speak Italian before English because their caretaker at home didn't speak any English. So when he was a little guy, he, he learned to so be talking Italian a little bit. I call him Giorgio Martino, George Martin, a real authentic bebop trumpet player. Okay, here we go, we continue. More Bud Powell. This is a beautiful ballad by Bud, which Bud recorded on Verve, and Barry recorded it live at the Maybach Hall. I'll keep loving you. <laughs>
Bud Powell used a rich harmonic sound covering the whole piano and one thing I would like to hear today among young pianists and it's the same thing with horn player John Coltrane great tenor player he played alto first so somehow of course Charlie Parker great influence but he played most of the stuff in the higher register and that became kind of a pattern for younger pianists while they do use some lower notes occasionally mostly things are in the middle and high register the bebop guys covered low register thick beautiful chords and Errol Garner which I will do in a few minutes uh, covered everything and, you know, that's the way it was in the piano history. Rocky Manyanov covered everything. Debussy, Ravel, low and high. Next, we go to a bebop pianist that came in the 50s, like Kenny Drew, Elmo Hope, Disciples, Walter Bishop, who was earlier, he, he recorded with Bud. But Sonny Clark from Pittsburgh moved to West Coast and he, he played at the Lighthouse. He was in a band there and did some recording there. But Powell influence and after Kenny Drew left Buddy DeFranco Quartet, Sonny Clark became the pianist. Swinging bebop lines with a bluesy sound that very loose way of phrasing and this is called Muse for Lulu that reminds me. All of my CDs in the past have been jewel case plastic that break. Well coming out in January Street Scene which was well received Akira Tana, Larry Grenadier Latin percussion Hector Lugo and Vince Delgado. I recorded this tune on street scene and uh, you will see it in January. That reminds me, next Thursday, first performance after the pandemic for a live audience at Yoshi's, Jack London Square. You have a parking lot next door, you just go down to the club. Great band, I'll tell you about that later, but Yoshi's I have next Thursday, December 23rd, and I will bring the CDs for sale. <laughs>
Sonny Clark and Kenny Drew spent some time in San Francisco in the 50s and those days jazz wise people didn't go to bed. Black Hawk and other regular evening clubs were open till one or two. At two o'clock you go to Bob City, Post and Buchanan, house band, who would sit in? Charlie Parker, Billy Holiday, Lester Young, and of course Sonny Clark and Kenny Drew were there. There were other after our clubs, you know. And you think six o'clock is over? No. There were breakfast clubs. Jerry Good, the bass player who did an album with Sonny Clark in Oakland in 55, told me, I played with Kenny Drew six to ten in the morning. <laughs> then they went to bed. Oh man, today there isn't one jazz club in, in Frisco, only Yoshi's, thank God, in Oakland, Bay Area. So those were the days. And then continuing after the 50s, late 50s, jazz workshop opened on Broadway. The owner was an attorney, Art Auerbach, who loved the music. One Sunday, I did play Monday nights with a great band with my Greek-American friend Danny Patiris, Dionysius Patiris, swinging tenor player who is in New York now. He's been there many years. So one Sunday, I remember Art said, Larry, I have a piano I can buy in St. Francis Woods. Somebody's selling it. Can you check it out? I went there and it was good. Then they brought it to the club. So Red Garland, after he left Myers, came with his trio. And talk about a trio. Doug Watkins on bass, Specs Wright on drums. Powerful trio. So I catch Red on a break walking in the aisle, and he was known for his special voicings, of course. Red Garland sound. I said, Red, how do you do it? He spelled it out note by note. And he was so creative, he used dissonances in his score. Like F7 wasn't just like this. It was like this. He would use dissonances in the left hand, adding tension, but it all felt bluesy. Uh, Red recorded Will I Be For Me with his own particular sound. Great, great version.
interesting thing about a red garland, maybe some of you are not familiar. He started playing piano late. He played maybe clarinet or alto. And that didn't matter. He had a phenomenal touch. Also, what didn't mess him up, he was a professional boxer. He had 48 professional bouts. He fought Sugar Ray in an exhibition and his piano touch was so light and the melodic lines and rhythm had a Red Garland special feel. Next we go to Bill Evans who started out, he was a boogie woogie champ when he was in high school in Jersey, South Plainfield. His father was a, I believe, Welsh uh, ethnicity. I'm not sure what business it is. His, his mother was Russian and Bill Evans went to the Russian church so that Slavic Eastern feeling was an influence on him, that melodic beauty. And he started out in bebop oriented music then later switched to his kind of free phrasing and developed a strong influence from Impressionist, Debussy and Ravel. This next piece he wrote in 58, Blue in Green, he recorded it on his trio album and Miles Davis used it in kind of blue. And what happens, Miles, a great musician, but he had a bad habit taking tunes and putting his name on them. From Bill Evans, he put his name. No, Bill Evans wrote a tune. He took two famous pieces from Eddie Cleanhead Vincent, a great blues singer, great alto player, four and tune-up. Cleanhead was partying and enjoying life, and he didn't get a lawyer. However, when Miles took When Lights Are Low from Benny Carter, put his name Benny was a great musician, but a businessman. He got a lawyer and changed that. Anyway, Blue and Green is also on street scene. The theme is film noir. However, I have to thank my wife, Roseanne Santa Craig, for financing and producing this as most of the records that I have. So this is coming out in Digipack, and if you come to Yoshi's, I will have it. Blue and green, Bill Evans.
one of the highlight memories of this tune in 2013 we were fortunate to have here from New York Bruce Hopewell he helped find, found the Napa Valley Jazz Society he brought some concerts first he knew so many musicians he did their tax financial work he was well versed and he presented so many musicians at the same time and then the gentleman who is doing a great job now Bill Hart they met together and they started presenting joining uh, forming Napa Valley Jazz Society so in 2013 at the Lincoln Theater in Yantville Jimmy Cobb came to town and Bruce called me to put the band together I played with Jimmy Cobb at Sonny Buxton's Milestones in the late 80s with the great bass player Walter Booker. So we had a groove already happening. So I had a wonderful band, Joe Berman on trumpet, Steve Heckman, who, who will be at Yoshi's, a tenor player from East Coast who played with Howard McGee, bebop trumpet player who played with Bird, Slam Stewart. He was tuned in and he happens to be to me about the closest to John Coltrane when he wants to be, even though retains his own sound because to me he interprets the beautiful train, not what some later people interpret over the edge train too much edge, too much kind of almost screaming sound. No, Steve can do that, but he plays beautiful train. So, and Andrew Spate played the role of Cannibal, great saxophonist. He's streaming from his home. He teaches one of the authentic real cats. On bass, we had Doug Miller, real good groove, and Jimmy Cobb. So we did a tune at the Lincoln Theater in Yachtville. Um, next we go to tune from 1924 by Isham Jones, lyrics by Gus Khan, one of the great lyricists. 1924 tune, It Had to Be You. Hank Jones recorded one of the greatest of all solo CDs, 1956. Have you met Hank Jones? The touch the swing is so delicate and beautiful way to play the piano.
Jones played until he was basically 90 years old. He was uh, in good health. He was one of the cats who was fortunate not to get into substance abuse or whatever, doing other stuff. Barry Harris, same. Barry was keeping straight. As Pepper Adams told me, Barry would have a little beer here and there, but he was smart. Hank Jones, the same. Uh, next selection, I'll Never Smile Again, has a wonderful history. It was written by a Canadian pianist, Ruth Lowe, good pianist who played with a band, all ladies, Ina Ray Hutton, great dancer, tap dancer, singer, had a swinging band, ladies band, and the pianist Ruth Lowe played in that band when her husband died during an operation. She was totally devastated. He was young, they're both young, and she wrote this tune for him, I'll Never Smile Again. One of the greatest versions was by Errol Garner, who played the full sound on a piano, high, low. Influences by Rachmaninoff, also Debussy. I'll never smile again.
besides playing very orchestral, rich sounding piano, when Errol Garner played in tempo, his left hand was like a guitar, chank, 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 right hand went behind the beat and on top of the beat. Booby, bah, bah, boo, boo, be, you know, but while he's keeping this left hand steady, he phrased totally freely and uh, unique, a unique style. Ah, so many memories. You know, you heard of the expression, time travel, you can do that. Go back, listen to this music and focus correctly, quiet yourself down, meditate. You go back in that era, listen to those guys you're taking there. It never left, it's timeless. And as we come near the program closing, one more piece will do. Uh, on the screen, since we don't have a charge for this program, I first like to thank my son Alexi, who does a great job streaming, and uh, he set up everything on the YouTube, on the screen you have below PayPal donations, whatever you can do, it's appreciated. Thank you, and once more, reminder: hope to see you next Thursday at Yoshi. Steve Heckman on tenor. Jamie Davis, the former Count Basie vocalist, they did an album uh, nominated for Grammy. I think it might be called All About Basie or That Basie, something like that. And then Hector Lugo, who is on my street scene CD, great percussionist, but Hector sings so beautifully. He's going to sing Sabora Mi. Wait till you hear that. On the bass, two Sacramento cats from Belgrade, Butsa. Nechak has been living there. He's got a natural groove. And Butsa introduced me to Jim Miniweather, the drummer who came from Portland. He's played with so many great people there. Leroy Vinegar, Ike and Tina Turner, uh, people in that field also in jazz. So two of them. So we're going to have fun time. If you are unable to make it, tell your friends. Next Thursday, December 23rd. So we're closing with Cole Porter. Just one of those things from 1935 with a production called Jubilee. But just one of those things became a bebop vehicle for Bud Powell and the other pianist, Al Haig. Al Haig was Bud's favorite right after, I mean Charlie Parker's favorite, right after Bud, authentic bebop. Just one of those things, Cole Porter.
interesting that was my first sip through the whole show some coffee thank you for being here next two weeks the holidays I'll take off from streaming and coming back January 8th at Alexis we're bringing back the outstanding great pianist Joe Gilman phenomenal pianist so this time instead of two piano duet which was fun and energetic in between two pianos we're going to have Boots and Nechak who played with Joe even before I met him he he played with Joe 10 years before Boots I will anchor the groove so that's January 8th in the meantime don't forget Yoshi's thank you Alexi thank you Sana have a good holiday see you soon thank you